We are now into the season of Epiphany, a word that comes from a Greek word meaning light, and therefore Epiphanies are those times when the light goes on. And therefore also, traditional signs of Epiphany and stories of Epiphany have been about light. The light of Bethlehem guiding the three magi, or however many they were, to the stable in Bethlehem. The birth of the light of the world in that stable. But as we heard last week, and also as those of you who are here for the 11 o'clock children's and youth and adults and elephants and camels epiphany pageant, different cultures understand epiphany in different ways. And while we Anglo-Protestants, along with our Hispanic Catholic friends and others, celebrate the light that comes in the form, I mean, excuse me, come, celebrate epiphanies that come in the form of light, in Ethiopia, it's a completely different symbol because it's a completely different story. Unlike other Christian traditions for Ethiopians, epiphany isn't when the Magi finally made it to the stable in Bethlehem. Epiphany happens when Jesus is baptized at the River Jordan by his cousin John. And so today, the appointed lesson that's being shared both in Ethiopian churches, but also in churches all around Santa Fe and all around this world, for the second Sunday of Epiphany is oftentimes the story of Jesus' baptism when the light went on, not just for those magi or the shepherds, but for the whole world. And the symbol is not that of light, but of water. That's why later on in the service, we will do the renewal and reaffirmation of our own baptismal vows, whether we were held in our parents' arms at the time of baptism and sprinkled, or if at age 12, we were held under, for three or four minutes because the minister wanted to make sure we knew what was happening, or however it is we've experienced baptism, that today we have a chance to reaffirm those vows. And today also we consider the story of Jesus' baptism. From the third synoptic gospel of Mark, Matthew, and Luke, we hear the story as recorded by the gospel of Luke. But it, even though it is called in the text the baptism of Jesus, it could also be called the arrest of John. So let our hearts and our lives be open to the reading, hearing, and understanding of this epiphany story. The story of John the baptizer and Jesus, his cousin, from the Gospel of Luke. As the people were filled with expectation and all were questioning in their hearts concerning John, whether he might be the Messiah, John answered all of them by saying, I baptize you with water. But one who is more powerful than I is coming. I am not worthy to untie the thong of his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand to clear the threshing floor and to gather the wheat into his granary. But the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. So with many other exhortations, he proclaimed the good news to the people. But Herod the ruler, who had been rebuked by John because of Herodias, his brother's wife, and because of all the evil things that Herod had done, added to them, added to them all by shutting up John in prison. Now when all the people were baptized, and when Jesus also had been baptized and was praying, the heaven was opened, and the Holy Spirit descended upon him in bodily form like a dove, and a voice came from heaven, You are my son, the beloved, with you, I am well pleased. Word of God, word of life. Let us be together in a time of prayer. Let us pray. Open us, O oh Lord, to the story we've heard and the song we've sung. Open us to the power of the waters of new life. 
and open us to this story that reminds us of the cost of that new life. That reminds us of your call and your claim on each of us and all of us to be about that new life, not only for ourselves, but for the sake of this world. We pray in your name. Amen. So before getting into the sermon, some biblical archaeological background. You'll find an insert in the bulletin, uh, courtesy of Lynn Raymond, office administrator par excellence, to whom I gave a ton of pictures this last week and said, let's do something special for the bulletin. On the first, on the, this page, the one that has the map, it shows you where we're talking about, where the story is set that Tom just read from the Gospel of Luke. Of the Jordan River that runs down into the Dead Sea. And at least now, in our time, there are two different places where supposedly Jesus was baptized by John. On the Israeli side, there is one baptismal place, and there is a similar one on the Jordan side. The Jordan River these days is reduced down to a very small, it's about the same, it's a little bit bigger than the Santa Fe River, but it's definitely not the Mississippi. And that's because so many different countries upstream have claim on the water, just like it happens here in the Southwest. And you can stand on the Jordan side of the, the Jordan countryside of the Jordan River and look across to all the hordes of people over on the Israeli side going down to the river to be baptized. The Jordan side was only actually in the last 10 years reopened because during the Six Day War, that whole area around Jordan, around the Jordan River on the Jordan side, was heavily mined and it was completely unsafe to be able to go venture out down to the Jordan River. And even now, you can't go running out into the wilderness on that side. You have to stay on the designated rows. The issues of the Middle East have not changed <laughs> in 2,000 years. And so it was that Jesus appeared down at the Jordan River where his cousin John, about six, years, six months older than Jesus, was attracting crowds and crowds and crowds of people from all over that area of Judea and Gal even as far away as Galilee up north and as far down south as Egypt, coming to the Jordan to be baptized by John to receive new life. Now John, Jesus' older cousin, was never someone you would want to invite to a dinner party. <laughs> Number one, he ate locusts, grasshoppers. Number two, he dressed in camel skin. And number three, he never minced words. And that got him in trouble. It didn't get him invited, certainly, to dinner parties. But even more than that, John consistently held the political-religious leaders of his time to account, especially Herod. Not the King Herod at the time of Jesus' birth, but that King Herod's son, Herod Agrippa who got himself crosswise with John because he took his brother's wife. I mean, I'll, I, I don't need to go into all of that. But Herod, Herod Agrippa, Herod the son of, Herod, of King Herod the Great, did not fall from that particular apple tree. He was just as ruthless and <coughs> deadly as his father had been. He was also into building great structures, great structures, just like his father had or adding on to the structures that, his great, that Herod the Great, his father, had built. Whether it was the huge temple in Jerusalem that spanned at s several football fields worth of territory by leveling a mountain, or the big fortress castle, fortress castle palace down in Masada that had not just one palace but three palaces, again leveling the top of a mountain, or another great desert palace on the Jordan side of the Jordan River called Macarius. You'll see it identified on the map. And the picture in the middle, the red roofed building, is a representation of what that palace must have looked like. Now it is really out in the middle of nowhere. And it took 
thousands of slaves to be able to build it and hundreds more to maintain it and to make sure you got water and food and such up to that palace. But the Herod clan was known for its paranoia and so they oftentimes built their palaces at the top of mountains to keep them safe. So just hold on to this for just a little bit as we consider the waters of baptism. This last Thursday at the cathedral in the, here in Santa Fe, the Catholic cathedral here in Santa Fe, in the St. Joseph Chapel, the prayer chapel off to the side, I attended the funeral service for Opal Hammond, a good friend who died on New Year's Day after a six year battle with cancer. Opal was one of these energizer bunny kinds of people. She had always come back from cancer treatments before, but this time she finally said she was done. She was 90 years old. Her husband, Marion, um, is an Episcopal priest, retired Episcopal priest, who's 93. They had been married for 68 years, 68 years. I'd spent many a Christmas day and Easter day and Fourth of July and Halloween and various other, whatever there was, whenever there was a feast day, Marion could host it around their table, along with the Martinez Yaliri family. Mary, uh, Opal grew up Southern Baptist in the Midwest, but she came east, or she came to the, to the Southwest to um, go to college and at that time met Marion, who was Episcopalian and still is Episcopalian, and converted. Her parents thought it was definitely a mixed marriage and did not approve. <laughs> <laughs> and then when they moved to Santa Fe a number of years ago, Santa Maria de la Paz was just getting started. So they had dual membership, both at St. Bede's Episcopal and also at Santa Maria. And they became very close friends and colleagues of Monsignor Jerome Martinez. And so the service was held at the St. Joseph Chapel at the cathedral, St. Francis Cathedral here in Santa Fe. And because it was a Catholic service, it began with the traditional words used in a funeral. When she was baptized into Christ, into the new life of Christ, Opal, child of God, was also baptized into Christ's death. The priest repeated it. When she was baptized into the new life of Christ, in her baptism, she was also baptized into the death of Christ. As a low church Protestant, phrases like that give me the heebie-jeebies. <laughs> it is not language that I use. It's not language that is traditional within the United Church of Christ. And yet, and yet, they were telling the truth. So I invite you today to consider for yourself, what does it mean to be baptized? whether you were dunked, sprinkled, held under, whether baptism happened when you were six months old or 60 years old or 12 years old, what does it mean to you to be baptized? Does it mean you have a ticket to heaven that people who aren't baptized don't have? Does it mean that God loves you more than God loves all those Muslims and Jews and non-baptized people? Does it mean that your original sin and also your unoriginal sins have been somehow washed away for good? What does baptism mean to you? Or does it mean anything? Baptism, because it is a symbol, has multi-layers. For certain, it means new life as surely as the snow and even the ice that blesses this world this day, with all that life-giving moisture, the waters of baptism are a sign of new life, especially for a desert people, whether it's the deserts of northern New Mexico or the deserts of Jordan. 
is a sign of new life as Martin Luther reminded the pe his people that every morning when you got up and washed your face, you had a chance to start the day anew, to start your life anew. It's a sign of new life as surely as the waters of a mother's body have to break in order for the child finally to come forth. Baptism at its heart is a sign of new life. It's also a sign of commitment. It's a time in which either parents make promises on behalf of their child or the person themselves make promises make promises about being a part of a community of faith, but also an ancient promise to resist the powers of evil and seek the freedom of new life that God would offer. One could argue that it's the same promise John was asking his people who came to be baptized to choose between the ways of God and the ways of Herod, the ways of life and the ways of death, good and evil. A decision, at least in my own life, perhaps in yours, has to be made not just at the time of baptism and not even just once a year when we reaffirm our baptismal vows, but every single day, just as it had to be for John and for his cousin Jesus. And ironically, it is precisely because it is a sign of commitment and it is a time of promise making, promising to choose to the best of our ability to choose the ways of Jesus Christ and not the ways of Herod, to choose the ways of life and not the ways of death, that baptism is also a sign of death. On the way out to the Hammond house after the funeral, I drove Jerome out and we engaged in a conversation and I had to confess to him, you know, that's not the way we begin services of funerals or memorials at United. And he goes, well, there's still time. <laughs> but he went on to say what it's really talking about and I knew exactly what it was talking about as well. But what it means is we die to self. We die to the fantasy that we live for ourselves. We die to the fantasy that we can make it through this life without being dependent on God. And that we can make it through this life in a whole and complete life living only for ourselves. As Dietrich Bonhoeffer, the Lutheran German theologian who sacrificed his life, once said, when Christ calls a person, Christ calls them to come and die. Whew, gets your attention. Our Martin Luther King, in the colloquial language that he would sometimes use in sermons, if a man, and that's how he used it, if a man don't know what he would die for, he ain't fit to live. The waters of baptism, as much as they are a sign of new life, are also a sign of death. Water has that capacity. Ask anybody who's ever been caught in a flash flood. And baptism has that power and that claim. Ask Jesus and ask his cousin John. A year and a half ago on my way to Iraq, I spent some time in Jordan where I'd been there about three years before. And this time I had the opportunity to go down to Macarius, the place of the palace where John was imprisoned. And so on the back side of that insert, you'll see some pictures, some pictures of what's left of that castle, that wonderful palace. And you'll see also the very same road because those Romans built very fine roads that led from the bottom of the valley all the way up to the top of the hill where that great palace had been. 
As I walked up that road, I was traveling by myself at the time. As I walked up that road, I am not particularly a pious person. <laughs> but I guarantee you that as I walked that road, I could not help but think this was the same road that John the Baptist had walked. Up that hill, up that mountain, and he would never walk back down it again. The last thing he would have seen before he entered into Herod's great palace at Macarius would be the Dead Sea and right above it the Jordan River where he had once promised new life to anyone who came. All that's left of that great palace are a few pillars that you see on those pictures. And about three years ago, the Hungarian archaeologists who were digging out that site came across the mikveh, the ritual cleansing bath. That's where those steps lead to, down in the left-hand corner. Because Herod, being at least on the surface a religious person, would have had such a cleansing ritual at the palace. And one cannot help but wonder whether or not the day after he had ordered John's execution by beheading, if he didn't walk down those steps into the cool waters to be cleansed. All that's left of that palace are those steps and a few pillars and a lot of dust. But we have John's story. We have John's story of the one who chose to follow in the ways, not of King Herod, but of his God. We have John's story of what the cost of discipleship might truly be. And we have the story of his cousin, who three years later would walk up another hill, this one called Calvary, to a place called Golgotha, the skull, and like his cousin John, would never walk back down again. The cost of discipleship is what Dietrich Bonhoeffer called it. And that's what we're about when we reaffirm our baptismal vows. And the cost that we pay may not be as great as that of Jesus or John or Dietrich or Martin. But it does mean, my brothers and sisters, that we are no longer our own. It does mean that we have accepted God's claim on our lives. That we will try to the best of our ability to choose the ways of love over fear. To choose the ways of life over death. To choose God's ways over King Herod's ways. Baptism is definitely a sign of new life. It's a sign that we recognize that it is life not just for ourselves, but a life lived for others. A life based in the trust of God, the giver of all life. And so I invite us to consider, both today and also in the time ahead, what in the year of our Lord 2019 does living a baptized life mean for you? How might you offer that life to others? How might you renew your own baptismal vows and choose God's ways of life for yourself but also for this world? Baptized in Christ's name, we are claimed by God. It doesn't give us a new ticket to heaven. It doesn't mean God loves us more than other people. 
It just means that we've said yes to those promises. Thanks be to God. Amen.